Hello everybody and welcome to our talk with the amazing title Unleash the Power of Eclipse Technologies, the Benefits of Modernizing Your Project. My name is Dirk Falf, I'm a research engineer and software architect at Bosch and I'm also an Eclipse committer in various Eclipse projects like the platform for example and I'm a contributor to several Eclipse projects. With me is my colleague Hello, my name is Harald Bakamul. I'm working at Bosch Research and I'm also Eclipse Committer and Project Lead of Eclipse App for MC. So here you see the newer picture of Dirk <laughs> and what you will see today. After a short motivation, I will show some general improvements we did based on Eclipse technology like modular repositories and things like that. The main part of the talk will be done by Dirk. Uh, the, he will tell you how we solved issues of um, services and modular loose coupling of our uh, software. And at the end, I will again show the benefits we already gained at our project. So the situation we had was we had a large uh, code base from different contributors. So from students, universities, and also from participating companies. With a lot of diversity in the code base, that was a barrier for new contributors to understand the structure of the software. And also our monolithic build made it difficult to react on changes in the development. So the goal of the activity was to reduce the maintenance effort of builds and also of software. And we wanted to simplify the contribution and the adaption of our project by others. So the first part, general Eclipse improvements. We tried to modularize our repositories first. So here you see one stack, so the migration component and its history and we want to move this to another repository without any other deleted parts back. So how do we do this um, with Git? We have some repositories on an Eclipse server. Of course, we will clone it. We will cut the remote branch so that it's local now without any dependency. We delete the unnecessary parts and most important, we really have to clean up. So it should not only be marked as deleted, but really deleted. And then we will push it again to another repository. Here you can see how I did it, but I will not go into detail. The only important part I want to mention is you should use the filter index to filter all the history. And I recommend to use a list of folders that should be removed. And in that case, you should also include deleted folders, or folders that are marked as deleted or renamed folders. Then you will get a clean repository with only your content. Next step, if you have single repositories, we try to also build Jenkins jobs that produce some artifacts, mainly P2 repositories. We can do this for different repositories and create also additional artifacts like headless, jars, or other possibilities. And in the end, of course, our main product can consume all the modules and create a product, and in future also perhaps Maven or Docker images. In case of P2 repositories, you should not rely on the artifacts of our build server, but you want to have a more stable structure. It's up to you to define it. And in our case, we have version-based folders, and you can see the repositories that also contain some comments. What is the relationship to that from C, for example, and some additional folders with the headless part and some readme how to use it. In addition, we try to improve code quality in general, and therefore we use the solar cloud possibilities of Eclipse. 
it was not so easy to uh, get the coverage of PDE structured projects, but in the end we were able to do the checks regularly and that is also a motivation for all the participants to keep the code cleaner and to avoid code smells. So now we, uh, I will again hand over to Dick who will present the issues. Thanks Harold. Of course I will not only present issues and uh, I will also show the possible solutions for the issues we have found in the code base in AppFormC. Um, so, while Harold talked about infrastructural usage of Eclipse uh, tools that helped us to improve, like the Sonar Cloud and the build infrastructure and everything, I will talk about code and, and build technologies actually also. So, um, the following topics uh, I will try to cover, it's how we provide modular product updates. Um, how we improve the startup performance, what we do with Pomless Tyco to improve the build scenarios. Um, one of my favorites, of course, uh, migrating extension points to declarative services and the migration from Eclipse 3 to Eclipse 4 contributions. Let's start with modular product updates. When I came into the project, um, the idea that Harold already mentioned at the beginning was to modularize the code base to have modules that can be built and delivered to, to users, like the migration component, for example. So we're using a feature-based product. Uh, it makes the product definition easier and it should provide modular updates. But when we tried to actually uh, execute a modular update, we found out that it does not work because uh, our product definition looked like this. We have one root feature, which is AppFormC tool platform, and everything else is below that root feature. And as you can see at the bottom line here, uh, here, the update and the uninstall button were disabled. So it was not possible to do a modular update. While searching a little bit, we um, found out that it's possible to configure root features, which even I did not know as a long-time RCP developer and platform committer. Um, and actually, the PDE developers um, gave us this nice option now in the product definition editor. So you can switch from a root feature to a nested feature by switching the properties or toggle the install mode. And by configuring for example, the converter SDK feature as a root feature. The structure in the uh, generated product looks like this. And you can now see that App4MC uh, converter SDK can be updated or even installed inside the App4MC product. The next topic, startup performance improvements. If you watched the talk by Alex Blewett yesterday or have seen the talks from Alex Blewett about performance optimization in Eclipse products in the past years. You probably have heard of this already. So the usage of an, of an activator is mostly done incorrectly. Um, an activator has uh, a purpose, but like the singleton pattern in Java, it's mostly used incorrectly. So why are there so many activators in your code base? because in the past it was created by the PDE wizards automatically. And um, it provides some features, uh, so, so you can get some feature access via the activator and people are using it strongly, although not necessary. And you should actually not use an activator because the code in an activator is executed in the startup thread, so it's in the UI thread. So everything that's executed in the activator is slowing down your startup performance. Um, I have here this table that shows the common usages I have found in our code base. So it was the usage of retrieving the bundle ID, um, which can be done also dynamically, um, mostly to use logging. Um, well, logging in Eclipse is a long time uh, discussion and there are various options to do so, but the uh, one-to-one -one change would be to use the platform get log option. Um, the access to preferences, which you can do by the uh, scope singletons in, in the Eclipse runtime. Accessing resources like images, 
And one leftover as of my research right now is the access to dialogue settings, but there is a quite active ticket that got a lot of commits the last days. So it might be also solved in the near future. So what are activators used for? Um, they are used for um, executing actions on startup. But um, the question is what kind of action and what kind of startup is needed? So is it only when the bundle is started and then at some time it can happen, then you can also use declarative services um, immediate components because immediate components are executed in the service component uh, runtime thread, which means you're not blocking the start. So often you don't want to execute something at the bundle start, you want to execute something once the application is finished in startup. And this can be also done via this um, event listener for the app startup complete. And well, what I also noticed is you can put a lot of effort in getting rid of the activators, but as I said initially, activators have a purpose. So if you have something that needs to be executed in the UI thread, once the bundle is started, then keep the activator because that's its purpose. And one example is the serious viewpoint registration where even the Java doc says we need to be registered at the bundle activate start. So there are reasons for an activator, but be careful with it. Now, uh, another option that I like very much is the, the build um, of our product. So I'm, I really like the POMless Tycho approach. POMless Tycho means you don't need a POM XML in the plugins, features, or test projects. Um, if you don't use POMless Tycho, you have to put such a, uh, a POM XML in every project, and the information in that POM XML is a very redundant information uh, with it, the same information as uh, is placed in the manifest file. So every time you need to, you change a version or anything else, you have to keep in mind that you need to update your POM XML file too. With POMless Tycho, there are no such POM XML files, so you're reducing the effort. Now, the POMless Tycho exists for quite a while, um, and since 1.5, uh, POMless Tycho also supports um, the missing POM in the target definition project, in product, product projects, and in update side projects. So you can skip the POM XML also now in these kind of projects. And if you're using a structured environment, which I have seen often um, if for bigger projects. So you have the structure where you have bundles, plugins, uh, features, and Relang and such stuff in separate folders. Um, you needed in the past uh, a connector POM XML to find the parent POM XML. And this was also um, added as a new feature in 1.5. So you don't need those connector POM XML files anymore. So, by switching to POMless Tycho with 1.5, we reduce the number of POM XML files to an absolute minimum. We have modules now that only have one single parent POM XML and no other POM. So we only have one file to configure the whole product build. And this also reduced the maintenance effort for, for the build where sometimes for version update, people were sitting one day to get everything back. Uh, Back running. We still have additional POM XML files for projects where we want to customize things, like the update side where we um, do some customizations to generate help files, for example. I have also written two blog posts about POMless Tycho, um, so if you're interested in finding out more about this, uh, here are the links so you can uh, read more about that topic here. Now, one of my favorite topics, as I said initially, extension points to declarative services. Extension points are actually not bad, and they are also not deprecated, as some people might say. Extension points exist for a very long time in Eclipse, and if you look a bit closer into the design, extension points are similar to a service-oriented design. Um, but in my opinion, they are not state of the art anymore. Uh, let, let me tell you why. So the first thing is, if you want to define an extension point, you have to define it via XML and XML schema. 
nobody wants to write XML and XML schema by hand anymore. And also the options in the, in the PDE editor for it are not very comfortable. By design, it's a one-to-many relation design. So one plug-in defines an extension point and many other bundles could contribute to the single extension point of that one bundle. That's also, you can also, of course, consume the extension point from other bundles uh, programmatically, but that's not the intention of the whole design. Um, another thing, you have to consume an extension programmatically via the extension registry, and you have to do this via ID, so you don't have a type safety here. You don't have dynamics at runtime because the plugin XML is read and interpreted when the runtime starts up. So if a bundle stops or anything else, there are no dynamics. Um, so you, you have a quite static thing. This is what you, for example, see if you install a new plugin, but the view is not already available in your ID. You have to restart. And it's Equinox only, so extension points are only supported by Equinox. If you switch to an embedded, run, uh, embedded environment and want to change the OSGI uh, implementation, it's not possible using extension points. Declarative services, on the other hand, well, yeah, they're also defined via XML, true, but you're not writing the XML anymore. We have DS annotation support, uh, even in uh, Eclipse PDE, although only to 1.3, but that's fair enough. We have a many-to-many -many relation design initially because services, a service design is a many-to-many. -many. You, you publish a service and anyone can consume it. You're consuming uh, a service via injection, so it's type safe. Dynamics are supported at runtime. So if you stop uh, a service or if you stop a bundle, then the service can come and go at runtime. And it's OSGI standard. So if you um, switch to another OSGI runtime, things still work. Eclipse 3 to Eclipse 4, so all of our UI contributions, well, almost all of them. Our editor is still Eclipse 3 based, but that has a different, um, a different reason. But we, uh, all the commands, handlers, menu contributions, and also the view parts were migrated to um, participate in the Eclipse 4 programming model. Um, well, that's a simple example here. Um, the interesting thing here is the add service migration processor is a declarative service, so I can get it injected. With the Eclipse 3 programming model, I have to get access to the OSGI service in a programmatic way. With E4, I can get it injected. We also migrated core expressions to imperative expressions with the add evaluate uh, annotation. So we can program our core our expressions. We don't have to define them in the plugin XML anymore. We add some context values uh, via model add-ons and we use the event bus in several places. So the goal was to reduce the code bloat uh, in, in our UI code base. We're participating in the E4 programming model, especially to get uh, better access to OSGI services via injection. And uh, we wanted to uh, introduce a loose coupling between the modules, so migration and the core was separated, and we don't want it to introduce tight dependency or a tight coupling between those two modules in code. Some examples, well, yeah, if you're moving from extension point to declarative service and you really use your extension point as a type of service, then you simply add, add component to your implementation, delete the plugin XML stuff, and uh, references are added via add reference. Um, on the service consumer side, um, with E4, uh, E3, we have this extension point thing. So we have here the um, abstract model converter handler and this method signature. And we need to uh, get the extension point via the extension registry. With E4 and declarative services, well, we get it simply injected, like I showed before. Um, I'll skip this um, or, or go strong, uh, fastly over it. So this is the event uh, listener mechanism with um, the E4 event bus. So here we have the an event listener that has the UI event topic it is listening for. And uh, here we are using the event broker 
to um, send an event. And that's also uh, for the other side for triggering a selection, for example, in the AppFormC editor. Okay, um, that's it for the technical points. Now I will hand over to Harald again, who, show, who shows you how AppFormC benefits from all these optimizations and, and updates we did. Okay, <clears throat> I will uh, concentrate on these four examples and I will mainly show what are the benefits of, of the declarative services in the first two parts and on the second half I will show how easy it is to contribute to our frameworks because of this new structure. So command line applications were now possible with Equinox headless applications. We could create it using Tyco and compared to a rather big um, headless RCP, it is now only 5 MB and it has a very simple folder structure and native execu uh, executables. And it's even possible to use the Maven BND plugins to create a single executable jar that is a, lo a little bit smaller even. So if you are interested, you will see again this blog from Dirk. Next one was we were now able to use standard OSGI specifications because we already have services and we could use HTTP and Chuck's RS whiteboard to publish the services. So it's now possible to reuse this in a cloud infrastructure and especially it's possible to combine the different services as a kind of workflow where you, for example, first migrate the model do some validation, transformation, and so on. This is currently done in the publicly funded project Panorama. You will also find some additional information here. The first approach is already shown in a blog and the second about Chuck's RS will follow soon, Dirk promised. So that's about the first two parts. And now two examples how we created frameworks based on these concepts. So we had the idea we want to have simple validations of our EMF models based on standard EMF and we wanted to be able to have user-specific tests or use case-specific tests in some cases. So the first concept is the validation. So we can implement checks for a specific object class and we can use profiles to group these validations to bigger units and this can be done in a hierarchical manner. We used Java annotations to do it, so no additional XML files or configuration files. And we of course used OSGI components to uh, define the top level elements. Here you see an example. So on top there is this Amaltea profile that is, here you see it, this Amaltea profile it has this component annotation and it implements this profile configuration. Below there are profiles that contain a number of checks and they also tell you it's a specific severity in this use case. And then the single checks, it's very easy to simply define what is the responsibility of this check, with which kind of classifier should be checked. And then you simply have to validate it and create uh, a diagnostic as a result. At our user interface, you will see this. And of course, it's very easy to find the connection. So top level components will be top level elements in our tree. The names will be reused as item names. And also the details will show up to explain what is behind one profile. So what checks will be executed. Next example is our visualization framework. So we wanted to be able to create a visualization for a selected element in our editor. So we want to make it easy to contribute. And as you can see, it's only necessary to mark it as a component to describe oops, to 
describe the name and description here. And then you only have to implement a specific class visualization. Next point is we also want to make it easy to implement it. And here you can see that for this create visualization that is marked as post construct, here you can first uh, give the kind of object you want to use for this visualization and you also get composite parts injected. Here you have a simple SWT thing that shows the label only, but you can use any kind of visualization like Java X or whatever is necessary. So just to make it clear, this is the complete code of a simple visualization. And the result will be, just to explain this, here we have the editor of our model, some structural editor, and you see all the runnables listed here. And below you see the visualization component currently showing this label access view, but because of our definition here, we have an additional entry and we can select our simple visualization here. So as a conclusion, I think we were able to really uh, have a smaller code base and an easier to use code base. Maintenance effort, effort is definitely reduced and the uh, simple contribution and adaption was shown in the last two examples. Main advantage of our actions now as we propose it is it's quite independent. You can do a number of steps wherever it is uh, necessary or beneficial for you and therefore it can be applied gradually. You don't have to do a big bang migration. So that's all. Thank you for your attention and don't forget to vote. Thank you.